I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president, you like I, I like I, everybody likes I. When retired World War II General Dwight David Eisenhower ran for president, he was hailed as a military savior, an all-American hero from the plains of Kansas. Everybody likes I for president, bring out the banner, beat the drum, take I to Washington. Now is the time for all good Americans to come to the aid of their country. Vote for Eisenhower. No one expected that in his farewell address he would identify and oppose the emergence of a new power constellation, the military-industrial complex. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. His was a prophetic speech, especially for a military leader who saw that a fusion of government and corporate power could lead to what he called unwarranted influence and misplaced power. Fifty years later, on the warning's anniversary, President Eisenhower's own granddaughter, Susan, documented how the military-industrial complex had grown. She wrote, in less than 10 years, our military and security expenditures have increased by 119%. This new book on the clout of the military-industrial complex by William Hartung details the power it wields. He told me how it works. Military contractors, uniform military, the Pentagon, uh, basically pushing their interest at the expense of taxpayer, national security, uh, in case, some cases their civil liberties. Is it a description of, of an actual reality? Well, the military-industrial complex is probably more real now than it was when Eisenhower coined the phrase. A company like Lockheed Martin, not only are they building missiles, uh, they're building cluster bombs, they're building, uh, you know, submarines. At the same time, uh, they're helping process your taxes, they're counting the census, they're running fingerprint databases for the FBI. So it's kind of morphed from just the military-industrial complex to sort of the national security state. So you've got surveillance as well as weapons building. Hartung says these companies, in effect, dictate our foreign policy. They've sort of captured our foreign policy and captured our military policy, uh, really for special interest purposes to a large degree. Writer David Swanson believes that this military-industrial complex relies on wars or the threat of wars to stay in business. President Eisenhower pushed war propaganda in the very same speech and throughout his career, but he could not have been more right. Uh, I think he, he probably did not imagine how huge the problem of what he called the military-industrial complex would become. It, it, I describe it as a banker bailout every year. It is a trillion dollars, over a trillion dollars every year uh, into the machinery of mass murder. It is over half of federal discretionary spending from the U.S. government. It is as much and more than all all other nations of the world put into the military each year. Uh, it is much of it unaccountable. Uh, the, the Pentagon routinely loses quantities of money that are as much as most other governmental uh, departments get. It's not just that more money is being spent on arms, but the rise of the military-industrial complex has been accompanied by an overall rise in corporate power, and not just in the military sphere. Military contractors now have disproportionate influence, says Sheila Krumholz of the Center for Responsive Politics. There is a huge uh, sum of money coming from defense contractors in particular, and these range from AT&T and Boeing, the largest multinational kind of Goliaths. Their primary source of revenue may be telecommunications or or transportation, but they have huge contracts uh, worth a ton of money uh, with the DOD and, and, and military. There have been uh, a number of uh, uh, pieces of legislation aimed at both making that connection more transparent and trying to put a lid on the kind of pay to play uh, uh, method that has ruled, for instance, earmarks. 
have we seen a pattern of military and industrial uh, collusion and, and, and industrial you know, companies that do business with the Pentagon giving more and more money to politicians? Many defense contractors were making contributions, spending lots of money to lobby, uh, and, and in exchange winning uh, contracts that maybe they weren't the best uh, organizations to, uh, to benefit from. So th there has been an, a, a lot of research done about, about how money uh, greases the skids for defense contractors. I'll also say that the revolving door plays an important role. So it's not just money, it's other forms of elite influence where people in, in the Department of Defense are kind of lining up their next, their jump to the private industry where they can rake in uh, uh, huge sums of money and lucrative posts from, in private industry that they used to regulate. Alongside the military are huge intelligence agencies with vast budgets to spy, run covert action operations, collect personal data, and conceal how powerful interests operate. Today, the former head of CIA runs the Pentagon and was replaced by a general. The head of the Navy SEALs runs the Central Command. Secrecy is pervasive in a national security state, even as groups like WikiLeaks try to disseminate hidden information. WikiLeaks, your baby, has, um, in the last few years, has released more classified documents than the rest of the world's media combined. C can that possibly be true? Yeah, can it possibly be true? It's a worry, isn't it? that the rest of the world's media is doing such a bad job that a little group of activists is able to release more of that type of information than the rest of the world press combined. Years earlier, an auto executive turned Defense Secretary Charles Wilson said what's good for General Motors is good for America. He saw no distinction between an elected government and an unelected corporation. GM was a car company that became a major defense supplier, buoyed by military spending, and then years later became a mortgage lender, driven by Wall Street-originated and often fraudulent subprime loans, until it nearly collapsed and had to be bailed out by government. The United States Supreme Court, in its Citizens United decision, has decided that corporations like GM have the rights of ordinary people and can openly and sometimes secretly lobby Congress and the public or finance political campaigns to promote their agendas. There are now many criticisms against Citizens United. Many of the arguments can be seen in this video by the Story of Stuff campaign. We have a democracy in crisis. 85% of Americans feel that corporations have too much power in our democracy and people have too little. 85%, hey, that's a majority. So let's get together and take our democracy back from the corporations. It's the first and most important step in making real progress on all the issues that people care most about. There is also a counter campaign underway against corporate control of politics, focusing on two billionaire political donors, Charles and Edward Koch, two brothers, both industrialists and both funders of conservative campaigns, including one to suppress voting by Democrats. Filmmaker Robert Greenwald has distributed this video nationwide. Folks like the Koch brothers are attempting to ensure that as few people of color and as few young people show up as possible. We live, uh, we've undergone a coup d'etat. We live in a corporate state. Chris Hedges is a best-selling author and former reporter for the New York Times. The people who rule America are um, the large corporate entities, uh, which are supranational. They have no loyalty to the nation state. They are harvesting the country just like they're harvesting the rest of the globe. They're implanting a global neo-feudalism where workers around the planet have to be competitive, which means being competitive with sweatshop workers in Bangladesh who make 22 cents an hour or prison labor in China. It's, it's a global neo-feudalism. Um, it, it's one that uh, is uh, unassailable, um, completely untouchable and more powerful than the host yeah. governments that uh, were there nominally based. Hedges is not alone in this view. Professor Michael Clare specializes in studying the country's largest industry, oil and gas. I would say that the oil industry or energy writ large, coal, natural gas, uranium, 
are, is the most powerful lobby in America, the most powerful economic interest. And it's tied to other powerful interests, automobile, highway construction, suburbia, many other industries, tourism are all linked to energy and they work together to keep America addicted to oil and to avoid the transition to alternative fuels. Do they have an influence on our politics? Do they have an influence on what happens in Washington, what happens in the ballot boxes of America? They're the biggest contributors to electoral campaigns in general, to the, especially to the Republican Party and I think they have a very powerful influence. Do you think most Americans know how powerful they are? Only the people who see this power in their daily lives have grasped the, the strength of it. For many Americans, the military-industrial complex is seen only as a source of jobs. And in fact, military contractors win political support and federal funds by promising to create jobs. There are real jobs, people working in the weapons factories and all the subsidiary subcontractors, but it's a fraud because you could take those same dollars and put it into any other industry, into infrastructure, green energy, education, or even into tax cuts for working people and produce more jobs than you do with the military spending. So it's worse than nothing purely on the economic terms. For years, there have been protests against America's wars and the military, but most have targeted politicians, not necessarily the corporations who profit from making weapons and other products for the military. One of the groups that's most visible in challenging militarism is a woman's group, Code Pink. Medea Benjamin is a co-founder. I've learned that we don't rule America. I've learned that the Democrats don't rule America. The corporations rule America. I've been doing the work on the wars, and I've just been floored at how powerful these weapons manufacturers are, and how powerful the contractors are, and that they have the ability to kind of keep wars going. I mean, that's that's pretty amazing when you think about it. Like, I'm just doing a lot of work around the drones issue. Do you know there's a drones caucus in Congress? I mean, instead of having a caucus to feed preschool children, you know, they decided it was more important to have a drone caucus, and that's because all the manufacturers in their districts are funding them. They are quite open about it, and in fact, over 50 members of Congress have created a caucus for drones, a caucus where they openly promote the use and sale of drones at home and abroad. And then they've now authorized the the, the, the flight of at least thir of up to 30,000 drones in U.S. skies for whatever purpose. Uh, this this is in contrast to the lack of any caucus for senior citizens, for children, for health coverage, for green energy, for for human beings. There's a caucus for robots. Eisenhower was so right, and he was so right when he said that it steals money, it robs us of food for our children, of health care for our parents. He was so right, and it's just worse and worse. And you get the little puppets in Congress, and I live in Washington now, so I see these little puppets and wish that they were like the NASCAR drivers that had to have their corporations on their suits, uh, but they don't rule America. The corporations obviously rule America, and when it comes to war and peace, those corporations are so powerful that they've kept us for the last decade in war, and if we don't do something about it, they'll keep us in war for the next decade. Beyond the debates about the role of the military, there may be a deeper challenge because the United States has evolved from a nation into an empire with a far-flung system of bases, economic interests, and intertangled business dealings all around the world. Top political leaders interact with corporate leaders at meetings of elites, like the Bilderberg Conference, the Trilateral Commission, and the International Monetary Fund meetings. It's all part of a global structure of corporate culture, politics, and power. Some, like the billionaire George Soros, told me a while back that the World Economic Forum is more like a networking party than a decision-making venue. Decisions are often made behind the scenes, not at public events. The Davos meeting is an enormous sort of cocktail party. 
a uh, lot of contacts, people meet and so on. A lot of things are discussed. It's actually very convenient because you can meet a lot of people whom you want to meet in, in a conf confined period of time. And it's also a media event. Is it also a symbol of the growth of sort of economic power, of over political power, a lack of sovereign, a loss of sovereignty by some countries? Uh, um, well, it, it is actually symptomatic of the age because you have uh, uh, presidents and prime ministers courting uh, the the uh, the, fi the financiers and the industrialists. Only a few Americans seem to understand how corporatization and globalization go hand in hand. Walter Teague was one of the first activists against the Vietnam War. He believes that Americans can't see the facts because they're trapped in myths. I asked him how he would explain this situation to people on Mars. I'd, I'd have to explain some very crazy things to them. I'd have to explain it in terms that they would perhaps understand. I'd have to not use some of the terms that Americans commonly use. Because if you use the language that we're taught in school about democracy, free, uh, free will, um, you know, all of the, how the United States is number one, uber alles, right? All those terms lead the person to not being capable of understanding what you're saying, which is that there are really, and have been for a long time, a very small percentage, 1% or something like that, who really make most of the decisions. But they are smart enough to make them in a way that keeps um, most Americans, until recently, from realizing that they're being ruled. We cannot undo the plutocracy, the kleptocracy, the lack of re representation without dismantling the military industrial complex. This is the 1% of the 1%. This is where we give a banker bailout every year and we don't get a dime of it back. We borrow it from China, we pay it back with interest, we keep interest rates ridiculously low, we crash Wall Street, we bail it out because we've created a war economy without any need for war. Well, I think if people had a better sense of how these companies, how the uniformed military, how their allies in Congress are basically running the show, scaring us into spending on weapons we don't need, uh, I think they'd have the beginnings of a tool to do something about it. But I think absent that information, there's sort of nowhere to start. There's nowhere to sort of plant your feet and try to fight back against it. So I'd have to tell the Martians it's going to be very hard for you to understand why Americans don't see how they're being screwed. They don't see it, except when it gets so bad or so contradictory or so blatant or so personal, and then they wake up one day and say, oh my God. Does this mean in a way that business, that Wall Street, that defense contractors and others have disproportionate power. In other words, are they kind of one of the forces ruling our country that most people don't even know about? I think that the money has great influence uh, across the board, particularly where the issues are arcane and they seem uh, disassociated with the average Americans where constituents aren't paying attention and they're not being heard by their representatives in Washington. I think where people are paying attention, where it becomes a, uh, there is a hue and cry from regular people, uh, it's hard for the money to, uh, to beat out the merits on policy. Politicians usually will not risk the political liability of being seen as catering to their uh, the interest bankrolling their campaign if the voters are paying attention. They're usually not that, uh, that unwise. Most of the public doesn't interface with the military-industrial complex because they participate in the economy as consumers. But even there, they're being affected by a power shift, an economic inequality that drives them deeper and deeper into debt. George Scribner is an executive with a corporation that advises other corporations. Today, it takes $200,000 a year to feel somewhat affluent. I asked George Scribner how he thinks growing inequality is affecting our politics. Who's in charge of our country? We keep reading more and more about big money in politics. There was um, a great article of the 1% by the 1% for the 1%. And I think it might have been Vanity Fair, but I'm not positive right now 
But they made a point that I, in politics that I've been making in terms of business, is that for, you know, since World War II, it was headcount that made a difference. One person, one vote. So you go, you play to the, to the vote, you know. One person, one dollar. You played to the, as many people as you could to get the dollars. Now, because the assets are concentrated at the high end in the hands of the few, actually money is much more valuable both to politicians and to marketers than the mass of people that comprised the middle class. So is the mass of people being left out now, the mass of Americans? They certainly, they aren't being left out, but they're certainly um, less important. So I think in a variety of ways you'll see them being less catered to and manipulated more, in a sense, um, and po in politics and in terms of marketing, there'll be fewer products and fewer services. That's one view from inside the corporate world, essentially saying that the majority of Americans have less economic power and as a result, less political power. People with money rule America because people with money can um, acquire power through that. Um, but we all have, the great thing about America is all we, we all live within the myth that each one of us can make a difference. And I think there are enough opportunities for that to happen that makes me think that the future will be, won't be as bleak as it seems sometimes. Let's hope so. Certainly most Americans believe their future is bright, but given the trends we've explored about who's in power, there certainly are doubts, especially because of the danger and threat of new wars that are being planned secretly, according to Professor Stanley Aronowitz. There'll be a war against Iran. There, as a matter of fact, unless you refuse to uh, count um, embargoes, um, uh, things like that are going on at this very moment, that is to say in March of 2012, that's an act of, that is virtually an act of war. Uh, that we are saying to the Iranians, either you bow to our demand that you do not develop nuclear weapons and you renounce nuclear weapons, or otherwise we will continue to, to bar your goods from going back and forth. I mean, after all, the market is part of the, uh, the system. So they're saying you have no market rights. So there is a, a war underway right now. I think so. But most Americans don't really know it, do they? That's right. Do they really know about this power elite? Do they really know no. about what C. Wright Mills talked about so many years ago? Why is that? And how can that change? Because we don't have a left that really continually, in an effective way, talks about who has power in America. We have, we, the, the Occupy movement talked about 99% being deprived of uh, economic uh, power and uh, about inequality, but it is not even close to being an analysis that can be um, uh, disseminated throughout the uh, entire society. We don't have, a, we don't have a, daily news, a system of daily newspapers. We don't have a weekly newspaper. We have Twitter, we have you know, uh, various other kinds of social media that we have access to, but it does not replace the kind of systematic analysis that could take place as a result of having our own media. So Americans, in a way, are still in the dark, and I think you know, the left forum and so many other efforts are attempts to challenge that, to change that. Well, yes, that's right. Even as President Eisenhower exposed the military-industrial complex, he also expressed a very American, deeply felt desire for peace and justice that history has largely forgotten. From the earth. And that in the goodness of time, all peoples will come to live together in a peace guaranteed by the binding force of mutual respect and love. Coming up in the next episode of Who Rules America? The Power of the Media. Uh, Ambassador, last thing. If so if you're looking at who rules America or who owns America, it's the same people that propagandize to America. Next time on Who Rules America.